Hello, and a very warm welcome to this edition of the National Book Festival Presents, brought to you by the Library of Congress. My name is Marie Arana, and I'm the Literary Director of the Library of Congress. With our last two programs, we launched a brand new series called Connecting the World with Words. In the first, we featured the winner of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction in 2019, the novelist Richard Ford, who talked about the universality of stories and the way that they bring the human connection to us so directly. In the second, we brought together two individuals whose work is devoted to culture, creativity, and the preservation of history, the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, and Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Lonnie Bunch, talking about the importance of words in times of social unrest. Today, we take the conversation halfway around the world to China with the celebrated award-winning poet and American novelist, Ha Jin, author of many wonderful work, books inspired by China, including Waiting, War Trash, The Boat Rocker, and most recently, a biography of the legendary poet, Li Bai, titled The Banished Immortal, as well as a book of poems, A Distant Center. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ha Jin to this ongoing conversation, speaking with him today about literature in a wider world is my friend and colleague, Rob Casper, head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. Over to you, Rob. Thanks so much, Marie. And thank you, Hajin, for being here today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marie. She has been you know, <laughs> arranging this for a long time, yes. Yes, yes, and I'm excited. We finally have the opportunity to talk uh, virtually uh, about this incredible book and uh, Essential Poet. Before we begin, I would like to say a little bit about the Asian division at the Library of Congress. It has more than 4 million items in over 190 Asian languages and dialects. The Chinese collection alone has 1.2 million volumes, which makes it the largest Chinese collection outside of China. To give you a sense of the highlights from the collection, you can check out a collection of selected Li Bai and two Fu poems from 1694, digitized and online as part of the Chinese Rare Book Digital Collection. See this and more at loc.gov slash rr slash Asian. So let's begin by talking about The Banished Immortal. I'm very excited to have you tell our viewers more about the life of Li Bai. So let's begin in the beginning. Let's talk about his family history and about the fact that he was actually not uh, from China. Uh, most scholars, yes, believe that he has, he is from the Central Asia, yes. Uh, there's an Asian city called Cui Ye, um, mm -hmm. it's in Kyrgyzstan, I think now. Mm -hmm. um, also, it was. It is believed that his mother might be a, a non-Han, a minority, maybe Turk. Right, right. And his father was a merchant, which yes. meant something different in Chinese society than it does in America now. Can you explain a little bit about that? A merchant, in fact, belongs to the lower lower strata of the society, and even nowadays, you know, business people basically they are always at the mercy of the power, and so it's very different from Western uh, concept of uh, wealth or, or business people, mm -hmm. um, because private ownership somehow can be violated easily. In fact, it has been constantly throughout the history in China. And so, in fact, in the best time, uh, they were not equal to a peasant because <laughs> they really, they were despised and they were, they, they by the child of a merchant, they were not allowed to enter the, the, the royal uh, exam. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, he's at a disadvantage. So that fact really undermined Levi's efforts to become a civil servant, no? 
that's true because he couldn't take the exam, so that avenue was blocked. He had to go other uh, other way. Uh, so that's why he there. There's a term called ganye. That means he he had to visit the powerful people to pretend his writings mm -hmm. and also carry favors with them. Mm -hmm. And to be a civil servant was to have power and influence in Chinese society at that time, right? Yes. Also, it means you have a, a stable income. You have power. You are in charge of a territory, a, a turf. And uh, sure, yes, it is. A, a, for most educated people at the time, that was the only way out. Mm -hmm. The only outlet. And his father had several sons who he advised to take different career paths. And he saw in Li Bai the opportunity for him to achieve greatness as a civil servant. That was, in fact, that was, uh, in fact, that was believed. And Li Bai didn't mention his uh, brothers. I think only his younger brother he mentioned once in, throughout the, all his writing. He didn't touch on the fam his family. Mm -hmm. And so, but we are sure that none of the brothers became an official. Otherwise, that would be a record. There was no record of that. Interesting, interesting. So that means they were uh, merchants or other kind oh. of professionals. Right. And while he was home, he started writing poetry and his father encouraged it. Yes, he started very early. He was talented. His father recognized that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but soon enough, uh, in 718, he left home to go study with Zhao Ri. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about that? Uh, Zhao Ri was a legendary Taoist, uh, a, a kind of detached figure, uh, but he was believed to be a wise man. Uh, in fact, he was basically invited to office and but he wouldn't do that. And mm -hmm. so uh, he was believed uh, he's learned man, so uh, very erudite. That's why Li Bai went to him, basically, mm -hmm. and to study with him. And mm -hmm. Zhao Ri did accept him as mm -hmm. a disciple. They spent a few years together. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that was Li Bai's first uh, experience with Taoism, no? And Sure. We, uh, um, yes. And at the time, Taoism Do was popular. It was a, a, a dynast the dynasty's religion, official religion. Right. So um, he might have uh, 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 been in touch with Taoism, but mm -hmm. the formal uh, education started there with Zhao Ri. Right. right. And he did spend time in Buddhist temples as well, but Taoism was a part of his life and later on, a, a bigger part of his life um, in terms yes. of spirituality. Yes, that part was uh, kind of ambiguous because he didn't believe in Buddhism, but he stayed in the Buddhist temple right. for a long time, for right. at least more than a year. Right. So right. he did study there. He also studied the poetry and the classics. There. Right, right. And it's interesting. Um, uh, in 720, he returned to his hometown, and you talk about this this period in his life that hasn't been much discussed among scholars, in which he becomes a petty bureaucrat. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, he became a, a kind of clerk, a very petty official, and he didn't. Uh, he was not proud of that, and he didn't mention it. And, but the local museum in, in kind of his hometown had had all the records, even the poems recorded him as an right. author. But those poems were not in his collected works, in fact. So in other words, there's another kind of Bai existing in folklore and in local history. So right, that's why right. I, I gave a chapter to that. Yeah, that no, was interesting. And I think it's also important in the context of understanding Levi's frustrations with official positions and the ways in which the the forces of 
the bureaucracy uh, yes. uh, didn't really jive with his desires to be a great poet and really even be a great statesman. That's true. And in fact, that's why it is an important moment in his life. He, in fact, by nature, he, does, he didn't belong to the official world. Yeah. Like he couldn't survive there. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't stomach that kind of life. But on the other hand, the irony is he really tried hard to get into it. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, as I read the book, I thought, oh, no, not again. Oh, no, don't do that. Um, but uh, before we get to the great moment of him joining the royal court, uh, we spent time with him and in the banished immortal wandering around China. Um, following this idea of we, you. Can you talk a little bit about that, how that started in his life and what that meant for him? You know, at the time, in, in the way still is, reading, studying, and the travel, they are equal. So you, a, a person also learn by travel uh, around, see the places, different places, and meet people. So that was a kind of education. So that's why, in fact, in his late teens, he started that. Yin Yu, that means he just wandered around like a cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, and for him, also for, in his nature, you know, he, he always had kind of wander lost. Right. He couldn't right. stay at one place for long. So right. that's, by, by, uh, <laughs> by nature, he's very gregarious. He wants to meet people and really enjoy company and Hmm. At the same time, he's extremely lonely. He's a very <laughs> detached figure. <laughs> so as if he doesn't belong, to, he didn't belong to this world. Right, right. Um, uh, you say uh, that Li Bai was torn between two worlds, the top political circle and the religious order. But you also say that nothing mattered more to Li Bai than his own sense of belonging. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that tension. Uh, yes. And in fact, there have been, especially uh, in modern time, a lot of scholars argue uh, and where he is, is his hometown or his home region. Mm -hmm. And uh, scholars and the people in Sichuan, because they are proud of this, this is a great, great uh, figure. Uh, mm -hmm. So they want to have him as their... Uh, uh, their own son, and and but on the other hand, there are records in in words by himself. His his family is you know, moved from Central Asia. And right. uh, on the other hand, Li Bai he did say he you know he when he met other uh, poets and friends, he would say I I am from Sichuan, from Erme Mountain, that is the Buddhist, that uh, the sacred Buddhist mountain in Sichuan. And, and so he felt that Sichuan was his hometown. So that's right. very important. I think that's right. very important, his own sense of belonging. Right. Uh, and when he went around the country, he didn't just visit people, but he actually also wrote poems and gave poems to people that he met. Was that common practice at the time? Yes, and if you are if you are a good poet, you know it's just still common. And even some officials, they are not good poets, and still they would give a poem to to others. And mm -hmm. but in, in the best time, he I think in a way he knew he was good, he was superb. So mm -hmm. he often presented a poem as a gift. Very often he put the officials as his cousin if the happen to have the same family name. Right, Cousin, right. older one would be uncle. And so he had relatives everywhere. We don't know <laughs> who was the real, uh, uh, really related to him. That was not, not sure. Right, I mean, that's one of the great paradoxes of uh, Li Bai is that uh, he wasn't Han Chinese, arguably, but his last name was fairly common and a royal family name. So. He got to invent himself, in a sense, uh, as part of the royal clan and uh, use that in his poems to great effect, as you said, when he met officials uh, and wrote poems to them. 
Yes, at Kyle, I think his father played a hand in this and invented the the uh, the family book. <laughs> so, uh, and they belong to they attach themselves to the royal family, yeah. and yeah. but the royal family couldn't deny that because the, according to the agent, the the, the great uh, general Li Guang didn't leave behind a lot, a lot of descendants. Yeah. And the royal family basically attached themselves to that general because he was believed to be a real Chinese. Mm. The, the royal family, in fact, from a very minority, a, a smaller clan. Yeah. So everybody at the time, they tried to reinvent their own identity. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he did make it to the royal court uh, in 742, but in the period from uh, um, 724 to 742, he traveled around the country. He met a lot of officials, uh, but he also met a lot of poets. And people started responding to his poems, too. Not only fellow poets, but um, officials and other people that he met that he passed along the poems, too. Can you tell us about that time and his, his uh, reputation uh, and how it led to the royal summons? And in fact, he, he was recognized as a major talent at the time. Apparently, the emperor Xuanzong, he, he really had read his poetry and also heard of him. Yeah, yeah. And his friend, I mean, Li Bai's friend, Dan Qiu, Yuan Dan Qiu, and he was a, a Taoist master, a very a, a, a devoted friend, yeah. uh, detached at the same time. But it's, Dan Chu was connected to a princess, uh, mm -hmm. Yu pr princess, who was the, the sister, younger sister of the emperor. I think that was the channel. Yeah. Uh, in fact, according to Li Bai himself, he, he believed he was invited as a Taoist, not as a poet. Yeah. <laughs> that was clearly that is the, the Taoist, the, uh, Dan Chu and uh, the princess, that was the avenue. But it, but his art was the major reason, I believe. Otherwise, the you know, the, the the emperor and the queen, they wouldn't invite him to compose the poetry and the songs. Right, right. Well, and it shows in terms of the assignment that he got when he arrived there, he was named as part of the Imperial Academy. And can you talk about what that meant? It was just, it had kind of resounding title, but there was very little pay. They didn't give uh, full meals even. Uh, so uh, he had nothing to do. And there were all kinds of uh, uh, scholars or, or learned men and also mysterious uh, uh, figures. And mm -hmm. one guy uh, claimed that he was 3,000 years old. Uh -huh. So that kind of, uh, uh, kind of miscellaneous uh, uh, people. Right. And Dibai didn't like that. He didn't like that. And uh, he tried hard to get out of it. Eventually he was really, he was given a, a decent title, an of, a official a office. Right. Um, but that part was just title. But for people outside the, the palace, that was huge. The Royal Academy really is a big honor. But right. it's just honorary, it's really, <laughs> Nothing. It's not a powerful or, or uh, well paid at all. It's just right. a, just a, 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 a kind of a, a decoration, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Well, interestingly, in the Bannister Mortal, you talk about his position in Chinese culture as equivalent to a poet laureate, and as you know, the Library of Congress is home to the U.S. Poet Laureate who does not get paid that much uh, uh, and whose work really happens outside of uh, the library. That wasn't true though for Li Bai when he was uh, a part of the Imperial Academy. And can you tell us about the experience that you describe as the moment where he fell from grace? Oh, he because he couldn't get along with other officials, and also he was very straightforward. He insulted some powerful uh, men at court, and and so apparently they bad mouthed him, and uh, he also he often got drunk. 
Yeah. And uh, the royal family was nervous about him. Yeah. Yeah. They were afraid he might reveal uh, secrets. And so he became a kind of liability to them. Right. And so that's why eventually when he resigned, the dean, the, the, the emperor didn't uh, try to keep him. Right. Basically just let him go. <laughs> and he lasted less than two years, right? Yeah, a little bit more than two years. He, he yes, it was a huge thing, you know. He because he was not an official, he was nobody, and he was invited to to court and became an official there. So it was really a, a huge national a phenomenon at the time. Right, right, uh, and you could say that his political fortunes continued to fall going forward, but. Uh, between that moment when he resigned from court and the moment when he resumed a political life, albeit on the wrong side, uh, he became a Taoist fellow. Can you talk about that moment? Yes, he, he, you know, throughout his life, he had been struggling between the two kind of heavens, ways, the, the heaven, uh, the, the, the palace. And he called it a heaven. He used to be there next to the emperor. He, he bragged about that. And the other heaven is the the Taoist the religious space. Uh, right. He became a, he would become a immortal and really a, a master of Taoism. But whenever politically he was successful, he abandoned the, the religious yeah. <laughs> heaven. Yeah. Uh, if he lost, he was frustrated in the official world, and he would turn to the other heaven. So for him, it was a struggle constantly. For the end, he said, basically, uh, you know, to be rich and to be a uh, power, no, uh, to be divine and to be rich, I'm struggling between two and got, got either. Right. So it's very hard for him. <laughs> so he went through quite the experience in the ceremony to become a fellow, though. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, this was a big thing uh, for at the time, because once you go through it and you got the certificate, you became a real uh, Taoist, uh, kind of a master. It's a lifetime achievement. And so the induction was uh, very arduous. And, and some people believe that hurt his health. Right. And, but he was determined to to get in, uh, through that. Uh, also for political reasons, he made some enemies at court. Right. He was afraid that they would continue to persecute him. Right. So once he became a, a Taoist official, they can't do anything to, couldn't do anything to him. Right, right. Because he was detached. He was, he belonged to another order <laughs> of life. Exactly. And, yeah. and he, he uh, wore robes always and and yes, he was identified as a fellow. Yes, and also, uh, and basically, for most people, for most uh, people who went through that, and their livelihood was guaranteed. Right. right. So not everybody could <laughs> achieve that. For him, it was a big deal. A big deal. Right. Uh, of course, being uh, Li Bai, he wasn't satisfied having served on the royal court and being a Taoist fellow, he also saw himself as a great soldier, which uh, uh, started back in the days of his studies with uh, Zhao Ri, right? Where he became a master swordsman. Yes. And, uh, in the 750s, he decided to join the army. <laughs> sure. He always he was fascinated with the with the military life, with soldiers' life. Also he, because he believed he was not just a a, a, a poet, he was also a swordsman, a, a, a really a accomplished a, a, a soldier. Uh, he want, basically it was part of his uh, self creation. Right. And he wanted to appear martial, really a, a, a powerful. Right. But but I don't believe he was a great swordsman. He 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 was skilled. That was that was clear. He was skilled. Mm -hmm. And but I think what he was foolish, whenever he was frustrated, he imagined there would be another life, a better life for him. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he had a little bit of bad luck uh in seven fifty seven when he joined Prince Yong. Can you talk about 
uh, how he found himself on the wrong side of the um, new Chinese emperor. Yes, and the political leader was very foolish, and uh, he, for this was for him, he he thought this was an opportunity, mm -hmm. because the princess Princess Yun was a, a, a also powerful a, a, a figure, and he believed that if he could serve that princess, he would be a a kind of courtier, powerful courtier or advisor, that can influence the politics, national politics. And uh, but the princess, the older brother, had already become the emperor. Mm -hmm. So Li Bai didn't. He disregarded that division in the family. He thought that he served the royal family anyway. This is within their own family. Right. Uh, but it was a bad cal calculation. He was kind of blinded by his own uh, uh, kind of a. I would rash, rash deed, I would say, very, very a, a, a nearsighted. Right. And he barely only escapes with his life um, as a result of crossing the new emperor, but finds himself instead banished to, um, to uh, a faraway place. Uh, Ye Lang, can you talk about um, what it meant to be banished for Li Bai, especially as someone who had spent so much time traveling on his own and at his own pace uh, and with uh, all sorts of possibility of, of meeting people and writing poems uh, to suddenly then face banishment. Yes, and he thought he, he would be kind of a, a receive a kind of pardon from the, the emperor because he was a, just a, a, a scholar. He didn't do anything. And but among all the, the scholars in the country, he was the only one who sided with this with Prince Yun. And the, the emperor was angry about that. In fact, the emperor intended to kill him. And but Li Bai was ignorant of the the enormity of his uh, crime. And so when he received the Letter from the court. Basically, he was shocked that he was banished to Yelang. That was a, a thousand, hundreds of miles away, far away in, in today's Yunnan province. It's really, really, very uh, marginal place, marginal land, and uh, he, that's why he took a long time. He was already already sick, man, old and sick. Uh, it took him a long time to uh, get there. And, but people treated him decently he, because he, he had a lot of friends. He was a legendary figure. So basically, he, along the way, his friends kept him uh, for some days, even months, just for him to recover and also entertain him. Right. So it was not too bad for him. And he had one final disappointment when he was pardoned. Uh, and thought he was uh, himself pardoned when it was more a matter of um, a larger pardon. But he had hopes that he would be called back to the court and raced back towards yes. the capital. Yes, because he sent a lot of poems to the, to the court and he thought the uh, emperor must have read his poetry and appreciated his loyalty. So mm -hmm. when he reached the Sichuan, the border of Sichuan, and the part that I write, he thought this was uh, intended for him alone, but it was a general amnesty because the, there was a drought, so all the, uh, uh, most of the prisoners were pardoned. Mm -hmm. and he didn't know that. He thought this was, this, this was just for him. So that's why he didn't return home. He right. stayed close to, to the capitals, uh, ready to be called back. <laughs> And it never happened until after his death. <laughs> right. That is the final irony of uh, Li Bai's political career. Um, and can you talk about that final summons from the royal court? Yes, that was uh, almost two years after his death. There was a he was in Antu County, today's uh, Anhui Province, mm -hmm. and so the 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 order decree arrived, and that basically. Uh, summoned him to court mm. as an official this time. Mm. And 
but nobody could find him. Mm -hmm. He died in obscurity. Yeah. He didn't know where he was. It's a, just a remarkable life. Um, and one that I'm so thankful to you for having uh, detailed uh, in such moving and um, engaging ways. So we've talked a lot about Li Bai and his connection to politics and political upheaval in his time. Uh, I wonder if you could describe how he negotiated that and how you might connect to it yourself, um, say with your experience watching uh, the Tiananmen Square protests while you were a student in Boston. Oh, I bet it was, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to make the connection. Okay. And only by he, he's homeless in his life. Basically he, he, he's on the road all the time. Uh, but Tiananmen is different. Mm -hmm. It is really, it is, we have a communist party. At the time, we don't have a party. <laughs> we have a royal family. Royal family, to be honest, they were, you know, they were just rulers. They were not that brutal because they were, they knew the, 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 the people, common people, they, they, are, they are the basis of the dynasty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they try to basically to be uh, benign rulers. Mm -hmm. But the Tiananmen Square is different. It's very brutal and basically it, it, the, I think just a, a bunch of old men uh, cling to power mm -hmm. and kill the young the young. And so but the worst part is that uh, at the time everybody believed this would be correct and they would admit their mistake or crime very soon. But 31 years have passed, and uh, still, basically, they try to smother, try to smother people's voice, mm -hmm. and also erase the the memory of the tragedy. So it's a very different, different kind of uh, brutality. Right, uh, right. There is no comparison in that sense. And yet, you as a writer have had to contend with that history. Uh, just as Li Bai had to contend with the uprising and the effect it had on him and the exile that uh, resulted. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there are few moments in the English original, I mentioned contemporary China, uh, I made references, uh, um, but all of those were cut uh, in the Chinese translation, in the mainland uh, translation. So I felt the books, the teeth of the book, were poor. And so that is really, is, the censorship is very harsh. Yeah. And I mean, the, the communist rule has been brutal, it's brutal. So, and you know, I'm not allowed to return to China. So even my parents passed away, I couldn't go back. So I do share a lot of sympathy with Li Bai. And on the other hand, I could see he was basically, he was his art that saved him. Right, uh, right. And he, I think he was aware of that. Uh, that's why he begged his friends and he also created one of his uncles and to publish his poems. Yeah, well, uh, I urge everyone who uh, has spent this bit of time with us uh, hearing about The Banished Immortal to get the book and learn more about Li Bai and read more of Li Bai's poems. Uh, Hajin, thanks so much for being with us today. It was a wonderful, in-depth and uh, engaging conversation. And thanks so much for uh, introducing American audiences uh, to uh, this great, great poet. Uh, thank you, Rob. And I hope all of you watching today check out more of the National Book Festival Presents uh, videos we're excited to continue to connect you to great authors and great books.